Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for supporting the show that we do in partnership with Scroll.in, one of India's leading news, information, and culture websites. Please check them out on Scroll.in. This is episode number 148. We've been on the air for 148 days of the lockdown in New York City. On this show, we discuss three crises, health, economy, and race. We're always looking for guests and theme suggestions. Please email us, sri at sri.net. On this episode, we are going back to WHO headquarters in Geneva to understand how the WHO communicates. We're honored to have with us Vismita Gupta Smith. She's at Vismita G on Twitter. Please follow her. She's head of strategy at the Department of Communication at the World Health Organization. We'll learn how WHO works with experts and the media about fast evolving science around pandemics, including a free course that anybody can take, bit.ly slash WHO MOOC one. We'll show you that MOOC in a little bit, the massive open online course. We're joined again by our co-host, Amanat Kuller, who's at Amanat Kuller, a writer at Scroll. She covers health and other topics. You'll meet both of them in just a few minutes. We'd love for you to share this right now on the internet with your friends and family. Hi, everybody. I'm Sri, and I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism and the co-founder of DigiMentors, a social, digital, and virtual events consulting company. Our motto, don't cancel your event without talking to us. Don't even plan a virtual version of your physical event without talking to us first. You see my email address right there, write to me, and we can talk. We love geeking out on virtual events. We are so grateful to all of you for being here, for supporting this show for 148 days. You can see that in the first 140 shows, we had a million plus viewers, 100 million social impressions, 260 guests, 148 of them women. We're going to up that ratio going forward. 53 cities, 15 countries. We had the chief scientist of WHO with us, the director of pandemics with us in an episode before, the chief learning officer. All of these folks have been here with us. Just an example of the wide range of topics we cover. We're able to do this only because of your support and because of my producers, Rose Horowitz at Rose Horowitz 31 and Vandana Menon at Vandana underscore Menon. Please follow them on Twitter. We're always looking for speaker suggestions, sponsorship suggestions. Email me, sri at sri.net, and you can find our entire archive in one place at youtube.com slash srinet, youtube.com slash srinet. Let's thank our sponsors, Muckrack Academy, Fundamentals of Social Media, a free certification now available for journalists anywhere in the world, mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. More than 4,000 folks have taken this class. Anyone, any background, anywhere can sign up and take this. We're so grateful to Muckrack Academy for paying for our ability to put this together and bring it to you. We're also grateful to Nunbelievable, Divinely Delicious Cookies on a Mission. Each box of handcrafted cookies provides two meals to those in need, 20% off with the code SREE. -E. Divinely delicious cookies on a mission from nunbelievable.com. And we want to show you our first video sponsor. Start Premier Nights. Watch the year's biggest blockbuster streaming straight to your screen, exclusively on Hotstar. So check out hotstar.com slash US and check out She's On Call, a new show that we've been running with our friends, Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar and Dr. Marina Korean, two surgeons in New York. They always have fabulous guests. Last week was Dr. Ben Chang and Dr. Claudette Lejam. Please tune in Sundays at 11 a.m. Eastern time, but available anytime on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube at She's On Call. 
All right, are you ready for our guest to talk about WHO and how it communicates? I know you are. I'm excited to bring you this conversation. And our guest is Vismita Gupta Smith, and she is here with us live from Geneva. And we'll be joined in a few minutes by Amanat Kuller from New Delhi, who is a writer at Scroll. So, first, let me bring her on and say hello. Hello, Vismita, how are you? Hi, Sri. Thank you very much for the invite. I'm well. I hope you're staying well. You look really great. Oh, thank you. We are, I love where you are. Look at the greenery. You're in Geneva. And uh, first, tell us how your family is doing, how you're coping with the pandemic. I ask this of everybody, not just folks who are responsible for trying to solve the crisis. Thank you very much, uh, Sri. My family is doing well so far. I live with my 84-year-old mother, who's going to be 84 in December. She doesn't like to be called 84 just yet. But uh, so we we have we have really uh, taken a lot of precautions to keep her safe. Also, because I I live with my 15-year-old daughter and my husband, who has a medical condition that makes him also uh, uh, puts him in the high risk. And since uh, my 15-year-old goes to school. Uh, it's been uh, a continued conversation about how to keep senior family member uh, and at-risk family members safe. So far, we've done well. So going forward. We... And so what is, so uh, uh, one word to your 84-year-old mother or soon to be 84-year-old mother in Kerala, where we come from, the Nair Fat community in Kerala, the, one of the biggest birthdays anybody can have is the 84th birthday. We call it Sadabhishekam. And uh, it is considered especially auspicious. That means you've seen a thousand full moons in your life. As you know, when these things were written a couple of thousand years ago, 84 was not even imaginable, right? Life expectancy was probably in the 20s and 30s. And so uh, we wish her the very best uh, for the Sadabhishekam in December. I love that. I will tell her about the thousand moons and the Sadabhishekam. She's Bengali, so I'm sure um, find some parallel as well. Um, and, and yeah, we're really looking forward to her 84th birthday. Excellent. Thank you. And let's ask you directly, what is it like to be working for WHO right now? What is going on that we hear so much news, good and uh, confusing about the pandemic? And uh, so talk to us about WHO's role in all of this. And then we'll talk about your job specifically, your head of strategy in the Department of Communication. So talk about that. Please. So what is it like to be working for WHO right yes. now? It's hectic. Uh, we work nonstop, but that's not just the people in communications. It's our, all our experts, all of WHO, all across the world. We have 150 offices across the world, and many of our experts uh, and people who are working on this pandemic have not uh, uh, had time off since uh, the 1st of January and even before that, uh, because uh, our experts and our staff have been working nonstop, so it's very busy, just like many other uh, health health agencies around the world. Um, it's, I'm very, very proud to be working for WHO, uh, and, and I feel like we, uh, we, we are here uh, with this big responsibility, um, but I see that all of my colleagues are, are so dedicated and motivated, and people just don't, don't give up. They, keep going. So it's a real honor and I feel very proud to be working uh, here at this time, especially at this, in these very unfortunate times. Um, and, and about my work, I, um, I'm, um, I head a team for, uh, for strategy planning and coordination for WHO's Department of Communications here in uh, Geneva, which is our headquarters. Um, and among, in the scope of our work, we uh, set the strategy for our communications right now for uh, uh, COVID communications across the organization on how uh, and we work on what we call capacity building, which is make sure our staff are uh, have all the tools, have the right training to be able to communicate effectively all of our life saving advice um, to our public um, and to all our stakeholders. We are, the team also works on different areas of strategy, looking at 
when we speak, when we uh, disseminate our information, what's the best way to get that information out? How do we make sure we have the right impact uh, that it's getting to the right people? Um, we call that measurement evaluation and learning and constantly look at it and see, all right, we need that. That didn't quite reach the audiences we wanted to. What do we need to do further? So that's a uh, very, uh, that, that's sort of in a nutshell what the team is responsible for. But we have a the Blue Radio Communication team is it works across the organization, not just here in Geneva, but through our six regional offices and in many of our country offices on the ground. And just to clarify for everybody, you've been at this because the WHO would have been alerted very early, much longer period than most of us or even most folks. Uh, as you look at the headlines out of the US, what, what do you see as the reason why America is in this state now? I know you don't want to get into anything political, but as you look at even the world map, how do you tell why some places are in the dire situation they're in and others that are not? So our experts have actually been talking about this. And in fact, I'm just coming from our um, media briefing. Uh, we, we, do, we speak to the media from the headquarters, our director general and uh, Dr. Mike Ryan, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, and a, a number of our experts speak to the media and to global audiences twice a week. Um, and, and, and WHO's message uh, has not changed. There is, we know, uh, regardless of where we are, in what stage uh, we are in this pandemic, what stage a country or a community finds itself in, we can turn it around by using the tools that the public health tools that are at our disposal, testing, tracing, um, and, and uh, in isolating, quarantining where we need to. But more importantly, we are asking uh, communities and countries and uh, to, to do their own risk, risk assessment and act to protect themselves. So to answer your question, we are, uh, WHO is watching and, and learning and supporting countries and communities uh, to, to deal with COVID-19 and to protect themselves wherever they are by using these tools, both at the individual level, at community level, and at national uh, level. Thank you. Let's uh, talk a little bit about one of the projects that I know you're very proud of this MOOC you made, and for people not familiar with the word, because you remember that was really big in 2012, 13, 14, everybody was talking about MOOCs, and now it's just become part of the way people do open courses. So massive open online course, and tell us about it, and then I'll show people the course as well. So I want to um, uh, to salute my, our partners in this MOOC, uh, UNESCO, and the Knight Center for Journalism in the University of Texas, Austin, uh, for quick, for collaborating. This is a collaboration that WHO did with them. And the reason for this is that we realized early on in the pandemic that although we engage with media on a daily basis through our offices, through our leadership engages with them, on through many, um, uh, you know, platforms and channels, what this pandemic flagged for us is that we have to speed up uh, the information flow, make sure that information is available to the journalists almost in real time on all our channels. And also we have to scale up and enable journalists because this pandemic changed the, the, the nature of uh, our lives in so many ways, uh, including the fact that every journalist uh, is now covering COVID in some way, whether they were a health journalist or not before this pandemic hit us, which means that we are talking to, uh, you know, in the past, WHO and health agencies were largely speaking and engaging with health journalists. But uh, in this pandemic, we're speaking with everyone uh, who's, who's a journalist, whether they were cover regardless of which beat they were covering. And so we, we felt the need to make sure that journalists have accurate information, up-to-date information uh, about uh, the public health measures that the public needs to know, that their audiences need to know, so that they can write uh, accurate, 
uh, health stories and that they can tell those stories of the public and connect them with the public head adv health advice as well. So um, this, <coughs> excuse me, so this MOOC <coughs> and this collaboration uh, with our partners uh, was a result of, of that need that came up. So in the end, we, uh, when it was live, we actually reached, uh, we had 9,000 journalists who enrolled in this MOOC uh, from 162 countries, and it's still available. So even though it's not live, people can sign up and they can go to uh, the the link we will put into the uh, in, in, into the comments, but it's a bit.ly slash WHO MOOC number one, MOOC one. But apparently I believe you can also get it by just going to journalismcourses.org from the uh, Knight Center newly created website. So maybe that's another way that people can find it. But journalism in a pandemic covering COVID-19 now and in the future is the name of the course and people can uh, find that online, journalism in a pandemic, there it is. And uh, they can go to journalismcourses.org to find it as well. Uh, tell me why you felt like journalists needed this and what are some specific skills they can get? I, I loved your description of how sports journalists are COVID journalists now as well, because everything is COVID right now. From, from our perspective, uh, we felt that we, we need to make sure that life-saving um, information about a disease, a new dis uh, virus, and, and, and about fast evolving science and fast changing situation has to get out to our, our audiences and our journalists need to feel, need to have that information from trusted sources um, and so that was sort of uh, why we, why this collaboration came about. Uh, but also one of the concerns was that journalists are themselves on the front line, covering um, COVID-19 in hospitals, in high risk situations, um, and putting themselves at risk as well. So we wanted to make sure they know how to uh, protect themselves while they cover um, this disease. So there were many different reasons uh, like that to collaborate and quickly come up with the solution. This course, this MOOC is available in four languages right now. Going forward, we will uh, we we plan to make it available in different in 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 languages beyond the six uh, UN languages. And so the hope is to make sure that journalists who are in smaller communities in far flung areas also have access to the same information that uh, maybe journalists from larger news organizations have. Well, thank you. And I look forward to hearing how people took that course. And you can do it over time, right? You don't have to do it at one sitting. So you can, I presume there's the usual homework and readings and all that good stuff. Yes, and the thing about a MOOC is really, you uh, you know, in, in situations like this, you have to see, you have to look at a MOOC like a little town square, you know, where people come in, there is a conversation going on, there are experts, there are different perspectives and learning happens not just from experts, but from the peers and conversations and in a, in a setting where people are sharing their perspective, their experiences. So that's how we look at a MOOC. And, and so people will come in and out, they can come in and, and look at one module, learn from it, go to the other one when they need it and do it at a pace that works for them. Yes, well, thank you. Uh, before we bring in Amanat Kuller, our uh, guest uh, host from uh, Scroll.in, who is a health reporter herself, I wanted to just do what we call our global tour, see who's watching. So Jonathan's watching from Union Square in New York. Uh, your memories of New York? My memories? Yes. Oh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. Maybe I shouldn't even say it, but actually I'll go ahead and say it. When I first went to New York, I told my husband, who's 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 um, a southern, uh, you know, he, he grew up in the south of the U U.S. and Atlanta, called Atlanta his home. I told my husband, something in New York reminds me of New Delhi, and he laughed and laughed. But but the fact is, it's a big city. I, I I grew up in New Delhi. Of course, New York is New York, and there's no other city like that. But my memories were that of a big city, with so much happening all around you. And um, just, I was fascinated, still am. Yeah. 
And there are similarities, including the crowds and uh, the love of food, which of course lots of cities have, but these big cities and the options you get in Delhi and you get here are really special. And uh, one of the things we're doing on the show is covering restaurants and what happens to restaurants in the future. Geneva, on the other hand, is even though an um, important global city is pretty small. And I was last there a, a, a couple of years ago and uh, can't wait to come back. Okay, let's see. Uh, my dad is watching in Trivandrum in Kerala. Hi, Acharya, he says bedtime for him. Usually we do this show, Vismita, in the morning in India. We do it at 9 p.m. Eastern. But when we have our European guests, we do it at noon or one o'clock, and that's how we uh, are live right now. So my dad is surprised to find me uh, here. Namaste to, the, to your dad. I've seen his show um, that you had sh shared earlier. Oh, thank you. And he is a former diplomat, so big fan of the UN and all it can do. And the promise of the UN is what really inspires him. And as we know, any institutions, there's always things going up and down, but his faith in the UN is really amazing to see. Uh, Lalita says hello. Uh, and Ashok is also watching from Kerala, so you have a good Kerala component today. Speaking of the South, Tallahassee, Florida is in the house. Paula Kiger, who is on our team at DigiMentors, does an amazing job and she says hello. What do you say to her wearing a mask? I say uh, to everyone, um, WHO is uh, asking you to, everyone to assess your own risk. Find out where you live, where you work, where you go to shop, what is your risk? And then you have a number of tools in, uh, at your disposal, mask is one of them physically distance yourself um, when you're out in the crowd. And all, also when you're not, cough into your sleeve, do all of that, wash your hands and wear a mask where if, if your health authorities are recommending that and where if you're out in a crowd and don't have these tools available, definitely wear a mask. We just saw the news today was that big American airlines of various kinds are implementing no mask, no fly policies. Even if you have a health condition, you have to wear a mask. And this is because the government here has not mandated masks. We've seen in a couple of southern states which have fight, uh, fought off masks. Now the mayor or the governors in a couple of places are putting them in. So it's fascinating to see how this goes. Lolita says this is information oriented. I think that's a compliment in this day and age. Uh, Kathleen's walking from California. Have you been? I have been, yes. Okay. I, and, yeah, we didn't ask about Kerala. Have you been to Kerala? I have been to Kerala actually just before, um, you know, 2019 December. I had one of the best vacations uh, in Kerala uh, with my childhood buddies. Uh, four, late, four of us have known each other since we were eight years old. I won't say how old we are now, but it's been decades. And, and we all came together with one of our friends, uh, octogenarian father and my 15 year old and for a week in Kerala, it was uh, just rejuvenating and beautiful. And uh, yeah, we loved it. Well, I'm so glad to hear that. And I hope you get back and everybody uh, who's watching gets to do those kinds of things, right? It doesn't have to be in Kerala. The act of being together with friends and family, my 50th birthday is coming up uh, in October. And I, I presume there will be no you know, my wife had planned for a three continent celebration. We'll be having a one apartment, one Zoom celebration. So that is the reality of today, unfortunately. Rahul is asking a serious question. Uh, how does WHO counter disinformation and fake news? So that's a, a really, really good question and an important one in these times. Actually, the pandemic has really uh, challenged all public health institutions because of what we call it, what we call, we are calling the infodemic. There is so much information out there, some of it good, some of it bad, but you, it's hard to discern what is the evidence-based life-saving information and what's fake news. And this has been a communication challenge. So there's a number of ways that we've uh, tried to tackle it. Um, one, one of the main ways, of course, is to make sure that our information the public health um, advice, the science-based, solution-based uh, messages and information is out there on our channels in, in as clear a language as possible, and it's accessible to people. Um, and, and, and so 
one of one of the ways is the fact that we have engaged more and more uh, with public and different audiences and media. Um, but also, uh, we have, for the specific purpose of countering misinformation, um, we part we have partnered with uh, tech giants from Google to Twitter to Facebook to WhatsApp uh, is a whole uh, you know range of uh, tech in uh, tech leaders and tech industry uh, partners who have come to us uh, and we have worked together with them and they uh, and our role has been to make sure that they uh, to to sort of work with them and they, they took the initiative to a flag misinformation when it was being spread on those channels but also to surface trusted and science-based evidence-based information on those channels so when you search for coronavirus on google or on facebook or on um, any of these big channels social media channels you'll often see who and the national health authorities information surface there so people have access um, to so <clears throat> Sorry, we're having a little bit of um, challenge with, with your uh, Wi-Fi maybe. We'll just give it a second here. Uh, we will uh, see if she can just come back onto the show. Sometimes this happens when we're dealing with uh, the you know international shows like this, but I'm sure she'll join us. In the meantime, let me introduce you to Amana Kuller, who is a writer at Scroll. Hi, Amana, how are you? Hi, Sri, I'm doing well, how are you doing? Good to have you back on the show. Uh, tell everyone what Scroll is. Uh, well, Scroll is an independent news website. Uh, we're based in New Delhi, and we have offices in Mumbai as well. Uh, we have we have been uh, on the ground covering COVID, uh, and like uh, the way the like you mentioned, um, <clears throat> everyone is a COVID journalist now, and uh, we have been impacted. <clears throat> Basically, like we've we've been financially impacted. Uh, like all of us are on the ground working. Most, a number of journalists are on the ground working, but. Yeah, we're all uh, remotely contributing to it. Yes, and you can find so, us on scroll.in. Scroll.in, terrific. Yeah. Let's uh, take a look at some of the other comments that have been coming in. My mom is watching from Kerala. Hi, Amma, love you. Let me pull this back here. I know that uh, Vismita is, is joining us again. There she is. Hi, Vismita. Uh, Hi. Welcome back. And uh, let's see. My mom says it's good time in Kerala. Anand's watching from Andhra Pradesh in India, uh, and Lalita has a question about the probability of vaccines. Cruel uh, Nani, which means cruel grandmother, uh, asks, is there any end to the pandemic? That is at least the YouTube uh, pseudonym for this person. We'll ask about all of these questions in just a minute. But let me also say hello to Rose Horowitz and Vandana Menon, our producers. They've been tweeting live and sharing information on Facebook. So welcome to both of them. And please tell us where you're watching from. We have another 20 minutes or so with our guests. Please ask questions. Amanath is now going to chat with Vismita and they're going to uh, talk to each other for a few minutes. So over to you, Amanath. Hi, Vismita. Thanks for taking up the time to chat. Um, so according to you, what role do journalists play during this crucial time? Hi, Amanat. Um, that's a really, really important question for us. Uh, and in, in, with the pandemic, so much uh, gets redefined and changed. But for WHO, the media has always been our partner in health to get our uh, WHO's life-saving information out there to the public. During the pandemic, their role, of course, becomes that much more important because not only are they the ones who will get our information far and wide to the communities that they uh, they have they're based in they also flag back to health authorities where uh, the systems the health systems are failing where there is a need for an uh, for a public health intervention and so for us uh, in this pandemic the role of media is really really important uh, and also we were talking as we were talking in in making sure that misinformation doesn't get out doesn't get amplified <laughs> identifying it a lot of our media partners actually do that they fact check and and present science and 
And so we depend on media. Health agencies depend on media, especially in a pandemic, to get uh, information, accurate science-based science information and solutions out there to the public. Right. So journalists the world over have been at the front of covering COVID-19. Um, like you mentioned, it, basically everyone is a COVID journalist now. Could you talk about some of the specific ways the WHO has been supporting journalists and uh, helping improve their coverage? So first, uh, first of all, you know, first of, uh, of, all, of all, one of the ways that we started was to make sure we scale up our engagement, um, reach more and more journalists. So on all our channels, accurate information is available because we saw early in the first quarter of this year, our, uh, the traffic on our website increased exponentially. Same for all our social media channels. And, and, and all of this is connected, of course. Uh, so uh, we scaled up and sped up uh, this, you know, the speed at which accurate information goes out and also increased our engagement with media. Uh, in WHO headquarters alone, the WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros, and our health experts, Dr. Uh, Mike Ryan, Dr. Maria Man uh, Van Kerkove, and a, a, a whole, uh, you know, a, a lot of our experts have been engaging with journalists in real time, um, uh, almost, uh, and definitely through our virtual press conferences. So daily engagement, daily media uh, interviews, as well as our virtual press conferences, um, We've done more than 90 virtual press conferences in the last seven uh, months. Um, and, and that's just the headquarters. Our regional offices and country offices are doing the same, similarly scaling up engagement. So uh, that's, of course, the, that was the first step. But also we've, we're working from inside to, with our experts to make sure this uncertainty and, and fast evolving situation uh, and, and, and the nuances of science in an emergency like this are communicated in clear language. So we make sure our experts go through the training and support them with the communication tools that they need to communicate science in a language that uh, the public uh, can understand and protect themselves. And then, of course, uh, the call for enabling journalists to understand science and uncertainties of an emergency through the MOOC, as we've been talking about. Um, the, these have, you know, I've been working now for WHO for 13, this is my 13th year, um, and, and nine of those years I was serving in New Delhi uh, for as the, as the communication lead for the Southeast Asia region for WHO, and that's 11 countries of Southeast Asia region. Um, and when I would go to countries like Maldives, uh, Bhutan, Timor-Leste, uh, the journalists there would ask us to, uh, you know, to, hold, to organize training so they could tell the health story better, so they could, they could do better health reporting. And we've always had this approach of getting experts together with journalists. We've just had to scale it up through MOOCs and also increase the number of engagements um, during this pandemic. Right. So apart from the obvious health risks of catching the pandemic, okay, the virus, journalists are reporting. Um, there's also growing mental health crisis, right? Because journalists are always on the ground, even the ones who are reporting remotely, they're consistently going through the coverage and uh, the rising death tolls and the uh, way the hospitals are understaffed and there, there aren't enough beds. So all of that takes a mental health toll as well. Um, could you talk about the brewing mental health crisis and if some of the ways the WHO has been supporting journalists uh, for that? So definitely, that is a huge issue. And, and I actually, you know, you could probably speak about more of that, having experienced it on the ground. The the mental health, the, the stress that journalists are under. Not just journalists, of course, everybody is. This is the time, this is a time uh, when everyone's life is impacted. WHO has long worked uh, with partners uh, to make sure, uh, to, to get uh, our messages on mental health out there to the public, to make sure the public, um, you know, a lot of the um, 
mental health issues and conditions are um, people are aware of it to work to reduce the stigma around it to make sure people recognize it uh, in time and address it um, to make sure people know people have the tools to uh, to deal with it so a number of um, you know uh, initiatives and work um, when we work with our partners there are a number of initiatives that are out there but even in this pandemic very early on we uh, made sure that the messaging on how to keep yourself connected even when we are isolated um, for general public all those messages are out there there were a number of uh, events and initiatives online initiatives that we launched to keep people connected but specifically for journalists um, it's really really important for them to and like i said it was actually in many many countries we are seeing the stress is not just the stress of covering uh, a pandemic it's also uh, all playing out in a in a situation where the world is going through an economic stress and and perhaps you could speak uh, about journalists losing their jobs um, for us it is a matter of great concern when journalists themselves get infected and are so for us it's important that they have the information to protect themselves but i'd love to hear your perspective on this as well right so first of all talking about the mental health issues right so um, as like a lay person they have the luxury to uh, disconnect themselves from the news and engage themselves in different activities uh, to get away from the rising death toll and just the numbers and just the information that is coming out and protect themselves uh, journalists unfortunately do not have that luxury uh, so consistently we have to keep us uh, our side up to date about the information and as well as the misinformation so that uh, we can counter it and have the uh, you know, facts with us and uh, the numbers and everything. Um, so I think journalists as uh, a fraternity have been deeply affected by it. And I think it's been being handled at an individual as well as an organizational level. Um, India, unfortunately, uh, is a country where mental health issues are not really talked about much. Uh, but I see that changing. Uh, there are more conversations happening within families and within organizations. Uh, there are mental health policies that organizations are framing uh, to sort of change that. Um, either provide like an in-house therapist for journalists to talk to and uh, figure out or uh, help pay for their therapy sessions and um, just have an open channel of communication uh, so that it seems like a taboo subject. So everyone is sort of aware that apart from the physical risk, there is also a mental health risk that is associated with uh, this pandemic. And um, so media uh, in itself is an industry that is um, that is sort of like really precarious in terms financially. Um, it's not it's been highly affected by the pandemic right like the lockdowns have affected advertising and uh, ultimately it has come down to uh, a lot of people getting laid off uh, people being on furloughs um there have been pay cuts um so i think almost every organization in india specifically has been affected in one way or the other um and, and it's been really difficult like i personally got laid off uh, a few months ago um, and it, it's really hard. Like, uh, the organizations want to support you during this time, but it's like they have also been impacted and they just have to make a decision. Um, so I think it's it's just a difficult time for all of us. Um, so I actually wanted to talk to you about, so even before the COVID-19 pandemic, the WHO has dealt with a number of uh, health emergencies. Could you talk about the importance of effective communication during such a time? So communicating risk to health is uh, always important. Doing it effectively is always important. But in emergencies, um, there is an added pressure. There is panic. There is an urgency added to it. And people are listening to, people are looking for answers. And there are too many uncertainties. That's, that's true for any kind of emergencies, whether it's a natural disaster, an earthquake, a fire. Um, and WHO is at any given time working on a number of emergencies. So while we are working with governments around the world on COVID-19 at this time, we've just, uh, you know, um, 
we, we are also working in DRC and we've just, um, you know, uh, we, we've just overcome and, 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 and controlled an outbreak of Ebola in DRC. There is also a number of other services that get disrupted in an emergency, which are uh, life-saving services. And so communication in, at a time when fear and panic is very difficult, and it's also that much more important. And in an emergency, it's communicating the uncertainty. When we don't know ourselves because new information is coming in, information is changing often, uh, and communicating science, it, it becomes that much more challenging. So for our, from our perspective, we have been for years now uh, training our communication officers, not just WHO communication officers, but ministries of health and our partners for, like USCDC. We've all been training together in simulated situations. That's one of our flagship trainings. We call it the Emergency Communication Network, which is a network of communication officers around the globe uh, who work for ministries of health, for WHO, for uh, partners like CDC and some of our donors as well, and some of our consultants who come to work with us during emergencies. We make sure we put them in a simulated emergency and make sure we put them in a, in a safe setting. They go through the same pressures of, you know, panic, deep deprivation, working long hours, pressure, um, and you know the political and other realities, and make sure that they they still are able to communicate health messages that will save lives and change the behavior that needs to be changed, so that people know how to protect themselves uh, from uh, disease, and for, you know, so that we can save lives. So this this kind of training has been going on for a long time uh, in WHO now. And we have built a, a sort of a network of tried, trusted, and trained uh, communication officers, not just within WHO, but in partner agencies. Of course, a pandemic like this will test us in every field, um, but uh, it, is, it is that much more, we're that much more prepared when we have, uh, you know, this kind of training. Could you talk a little bit more about MOOC um, and touch upon some specific trainings that would be provided to journalists? So for uh, from what we are seeing now, it's important if you're not a health journalist that you have access to, you know, public health information, but also have an understanding, a very basic understanding of some of the health terminologies that is used. Of course, we work with our health experts also to make sure that uh, we don't use technical jargon when talking to the public and talking to the media, especially in a condition like in a situation like this. Like we said, everyone, every journalist is covering COVID. And so we need to make sure they have the right information, in clear language. And so this MOOC uh, actually served that purpose. It's, in, it's available right now in four languages. We want to, going forward, make sure that it's available in more languages, more local languages beyond the UN, the six UN languages. And so there is, there is a, 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 you know, understanding and learning in a MOOC happens not just with the experts, but like we said, among the peers, the journalists also learn from each other in that setting. Um, so it's keeping up to date, knowing where the trusted sources of uh, health information are, and uh, also having a basic understanding of certain health uh, terminologies um, to be able to communicate to their audiences how they can protect themselves. Right. So you touched a bit upon uh, the importance of wearing masks, uh, right? So the final question that I had for you was uh, about the WHO's wear a mask campaign. Uh, well, the efficacy of wearing masks has been uh, highly debated in the last few months, especially in the United States, where a number of people are still refusing to wear them. Uh, do you see, can you talk about this campaign and do you see this making a difference on the ground? So the WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros, has uh, launched the mask challenge and from 7th to the 14th. 
uh, WHO, um, Dr. Tedros has already asked some of the celebrities, Lady Gaga, Alison Becker and others to wear a mask and uh, in solidarity. And, and, and the message really that he's giving and, and WHO's message has always been on mass that we that it is one of the many tools at your disposal. So we want, WHO wants every person to be able to um, source information from the right sources, trustworthy science-based sources, WHO and health authorities uh, to make, to do a risk assessment for themselves, to know where they live, where they work, where they go to shop, uh, what what is the transmission uh, th that's happening in in your area and then use these number all of these tools that are available to you so if you cannot physically distance yourself if you fry, find yourself in crowded spaces uh, if you can um, wash your hands uh, make sure you have a mask uh, and do it all that's the message do wear a mask, but also make sure you physically distance yourself, cough into your elbow um, and, and don't touch your face as, uh, you know, um, sometimes we're not aware of how many times we touch our face. So we're becoming more and more aware of it. We're all learning, right? So mask is one of the many, many tools available. And WHO, uh, through this mask challenge, is saying, do it all, wear a mask, uh, also make sure you're physically distancing yourself. Also make sure you're washing your hands, uh, observing cough etiquette. And most of all, make sure you know what your risk is. Thank you so much. I, I hate to interrupt you guys. Folks are having such a great conversation. It's also obvious when a healthcare expert uh, in terms of communication in Vismitha and a journalist who specializes in healthcare is uh, when the two of you speak, there's a level of conversation that's very different from when a layman like me is talking. So I know that Amanat, it's late for you in India. It's uh, 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 late, so we will let you go, almost, almost 11.30, right, uh, in India now. So we'll uh, let you go, though in some parts of India, that's when you get dinner. When an American goes to India, that's one of the first things we notice is how late dinner is, especially in Delhi and Mumbai. Uh, Americans eat first and then go to a dinner party if we want to uh, eat at anything close to the time we're used to. But uh, thank you so much, Amanat. We'll, uh, we'll let you go. Thank you. Uh, everyone, please follow, um, follow Amanat. She's on Twitter. You can see her Twitter handle right there, Amanat Kuller. And she's, she's at scroll.in. Her Twitter handle is Ama at Amanat Kuller. What do you have? What are you working on these days, Amanat? Apart from stories like this, um, I am working on uh, the Indian uh, issues Indian diaspora is facing, um, especially in the West, how they have been impacted by COVID nineteen. Because uh, minorities the world over have been, have had a greater impact. Um, so I'm just focusing on some of the ways that uh, Indians, uh, South Asians who are in the United States or in the UK, how they have been impacted and how they are dealing with it. No, that's that's great. Uh, I see a note here from Anand says you're a good photographer, ma'am. I have seen your photographs on scroll today, so that's a nice compliment. And Rahul says thank you to Vismita for replying to his question. So thank you for uh, for that as well. And Kathleen says I plan to read Scroll.in's cover story and more today. It looks so useful. I'm so grateful for the WHO and UN steadfastness and information sharing during this COVID-19 pandemic. So it's Great to hear that. Lalita asked, how is fake news dealt with during this time? Uh, at least on social media, maybe I'll ask her that. We'll let you go, Amana. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Vismita, your thoughts on social media? You know, you're the director of strategy in the Department of Communication. So you get to play a role in deciding how, how you use these different platforms. Of course, there's a full social media team and everything, but we'd love to hear your thoughts. So I am um, just a minor correction. I'm the uh, head of uh, strat the strategy team. We have a director of communications who is very much uh, our, our leader and is, is, is leading on this. And uh, on social media, we have a really, really um, fantastic team, although it's very small. You'd be surprised at how much work. I don't think they sleep. Uh, I don't think they've slept since 
this uh, pandemic um, has been upon us. Uh, they work day and night, and 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 misinformation is uh, in on social media is something that we are all concerned about. It, um, sometimes we are able to quickly get the corrections out there, but um, fake news, especially vicious, malicious, uh, very agenda-driven news, uh, often spreads through very well-established misinformation networks and 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 spreads on channels uh where there is there may not be a way to counter them like whatsapp and messenger on social media you can post uh correction and and then there is a you know then your audience and then make sure that information is out there but but when you have a channel where you don't have a way of uh, you know, countering and then pushing out that information like some of the social media channels have, that is a real challenge. I can't say that we have found an answer uh, and, I, and definitely certain kinds of misinformation and attacks on science and um, all of that is, is very difficult uh, to, to, to match and to combat in scale um, or speed, because like I said, they, they're spread through well-established uh, networks. Um, but, but our attempt is to make sure that we get the right information about science, solidarity, and solutions out there every time, every day, no matter how many times we have to repeat it on how many channels. Uh, we just uh, make sure we keep at it. And thanks to our social media team for that. Science. Solidarity yeah. solutions, right? Yeah. Okay. So we, solutions and solidarity. Okay, I like that. Uh, lots of comments coming in, and I realize that the comments about the photography were about Vandana Menon's reporting live from Times Square yesterday. She did a cover story about what's happening. Uh, the the with with some of the reverberations of what happens in India. Happen, the attention is paid in the U.S. as well. So uh, before you go, I would just like to give you a chance to reflect a little bit on these seven months and how do you decide how safe everything is for your family to travel, for your kid to go to school. Of course, Geneva and Switzerland, I presume, are doing things better than anybody else, or at least as good as in the world. And how do you keep both your 15-year-old and your 83 and a half year old uh, uh, safe? So reflecting back on the last seven months, it's been life changing for everyone um, and it has impacted everybody. I think, uh, I hope I get to be 83 and a half like my mother and then I'll look back and I hope I'll get to say that, um, that we did everything we could to save lives and get the right information out there. I know that I will be looking back and saying I was very proud to have been working with WHO with extremely motivated, um, talented uh, experts uh, who just don't tire and who keep working. Um, and, and for me, um, this, this whole challenge at home of having an octogenarian mother, a 15-year-old, and, and a husband who is in the high-risk uh, uh, category, it just uh, for, for us, it's a reminder, daily reminder, of um, that we have to, there is, there are, there are no shortcuts. We have to follow uh, the public health advice. And so we may, we do a risk assessment for ourselves uh, almost on a daily basis. We watch the number of cases going up or down. I live slightly outside Geneva, but I work in Geneva. I commute there every day. In our office, we are extremely careful. Not all of WHO staff are back uh, to work. Most of us are still working remotely, but those of us who do go in follow all the precautions, physical distancing, wearing masks when we have to. Um, our corridors have uh, signs uh, so that traffic only goes in one direction and, and, and we don't, uh, and we minimize uh, one person in the elevator at a time, which means that we have to take the stairs more often, uh, which is good for all of us uh, anyway. And so all of that every day tirelessly without saying i'm tired let me just not wear a mask today that is the way to go that is what who is asking everyone to do it's not easy but that that is 
that is how we look at it from our family perspective. And I hope all of you would uh, continue to do that and stay safe and stay healthy. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Our guest has been Vismita Gupta Smith, who is at Vismita G on Twitter in, in Hindi. And uh, when we say to uh, someone, we might say, we might add the letter J I. And so Vismita G works in both ways. So like you say Gandhi G or someone you give respect to, you add the G. So she's at Vismita G G. Uh, and thank you. So much for, <laughs> thank you very much for being here. And, uh, and uh, uh, Lalita says, thank you so much for picking up my questions and answering them patiently. And that's uh, beautiful that you were able to do that. We'll let you go. You've had a long day. I know you had a press conference just before you came to this. I'm really grateful to you. And we look forward to hearing more from the WHO in this pandemic. We need all of us to collaborate, cooperate, so we can all be successful and look back in years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we're just very grateful to Vismita and her colleagues at the, in the Office of Communications at WHO at the World Health Organization. Please check them out, of course, on at WHO and check out the MOOC that we talked about. We put in that link as well so that you can learn. And these journalists, more than 9,000 people have taken that course. I am so grateful to all of you for being here, for your uh, support of the work we do and for supporting this show, 148 shows with two more days to our 150th episode. And we would love your ideas of what we should be doing. Uh, are there any favorite guests that you would like us to bring back? Please let us know about that. And with that, we want to uh, thank you all and also thank our sponsors once again. Uh, we start with Muckrack Academy, Fundamentals of Social Media for journalists, PR pros, and everyone. Free certification now available, mrac.co slash social mrac.co slash social. We also want to thank Nunbelievable, Divinely Delicious Cookies on a Mission, 20% off with the code SRE, S-R-E-E, nunbelievable.com. And we want to say hello to the team at She's On Call, Sundays at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, at She's On Call on Facebook, at She's On Call on Twitter, two surgeons talking about medical issues and taking your questions with fabulous guests. And tonight we have a special show that we're helping produce, Little Steven's Roadshow, co-hosted by Drew Carey. Little Steven, you know as Stevie Van Zant from The Sopranos, from Lilyhammer, from the E Street Band. And the guest lineup is incredible. Alice Cooper, Wayne Kramer, Martha Reeves, Nick Speed, and so many others. You won't want to miss this. Go to teachrock.org slash roadshow, teachrock.org slash roadshow, and our video sponsor. Start Premier Nights. Watch the year's biggest blockbuster streaming straight to your screen. Exclusively on Hotstar. And don't forget to join our WhatsApp alert system. This is not yet another WhatsApp group. All you do is hold up your phone and you'll get an alert when we're live on WhatsApp. So you'll get an alert whenever I'm live on these shows. So please check that out. Thank you very much, everybody. Please email me with your questions, suggestions, collaborations. We are still here, still covering the crisis, and we want your questions and comments. Please let us know and please be in touch. Three at three.net. 